Everyone hear me? Yay. Okay, uh, this, source, this uh, talk is on open source music tracking 2.0. And uh, we'll start with the uh, open source music part. I mean, we've had music notation for centuries. Open source music has historically been open source. Right? Well, not quite. Because we've always needed humans in the loop. We've always had humans playing instruments in order to actually get the music from score to performance. And humans doing this stuff in real time is uh, kind of hard. Looks a bit like this. And this takes uh, a lot of practice. If you're really, really, really good, you can do it in front of an audience. This is suboptimal, frankly. What we need are machines to take the real-time component out of it so that we don't have to program, we can program the machines instead of programming our cerebellum. So, way back when, we had things like player pianos and other early attempts such as barrel organs, but they weren't really open source because Music came on rolls, but you couldn't modify the rolls, you couldn't make the rolls yourself. So, when better technology like recording came along, they vanished pretty much completely. So, by the 1930s, they'd gone, and recording just got better and better and better. And pretty much by the 1980s, we had recording that was indistinguishable from a live performance, even to a uh, trained listener. And there has been this assumption for a long time now, that recordings are the best way, the only way, to distribute music. Simply because they have been around for such a long time, and all of the other technology has sucked. And these assumptions are kind of uh, leading us astray, I think. And this is what I really want to talk about. There is nothing you can do, basically, with a recording other than listen to it. So... We want to do more than that. What we want is for end users to have the same freedom that the people who actually made the stuff to start with have. We want to be able to hack this. We want to be able to take it apart. We want to be able to tinker with it. We want to be able to put it back together again. We want to put it, uh, we want to remix it exactly how we want to do it. And you just can't do this with recordings. So, before computers actually caught up with enough memory and uh, bandwidth and uh, whatnot to be able to do CD quality audio. Computers were used for music. This, uh, I'm sure you've run into this stuff before. Well, I'm suspecting you have. We had all of this stuff by the early 1990s. And it, this stuff basically started on the Amiga but it spread very rapidly into the uh, PC world and to uh, every platform under the sun, basically. And we've got these big four formats here, and they were sample-based. By which, uh, I mean, basically there were samples and uh, pattern data which consists of uh, what pitches and uh, what order and what uh, times to play the samples back at. This was surprisingly useful yeah, I mean, you wouldn't have thought that that was a particularly useful way of mis making music, but uh, not just because it was all people had, but it is actually a surprisingly flexible and uh, good way of doing things. And it has fallen out of complete... It's, it's essentially vanished at this point when MP3 came along. People no longer write uh, stuff using this kind of stuff, and they certainly don't distribute it using this... Uh,
kind of uh, system. So just some kind of show of hands here. Who has run into these formats before? Anyone written stuff in them? Has anyone written any software to play them? Any kind of, uh, anyone written a tracker or a play routine or a demo that has used this stuff? Okay, that's good to know. Problem is, they have an image problem these days, the trackers. Here's a little quote from a, a few years back. But uh, things are essentially uh, unchanged since then. In fact, they've headed even more towards the idea that uh, this stuff is uh, retro and there is no point in uh, using it if you are not actually interested in uh, old technology for old technology's sake. I have some points of agreement with this guy. He is right that trackers suck. What I have a disagreement with is that they are unsalvageable as technology, and we, the nice thing about them is that they are open source, they are hackable. You get essentially complete control, the same amount of control as the person who wrote the tune had, and that is a really, really nifty thing to have, and I think it's worth preserving. So, why trackers suck? There's technical reasons for why actually people don't write stuff using them anymore. A lot of people who were, were well known for writing and distributing track music in the 1990s have switched to uh, using MP3 instead. Who knows what they make their stuff with? We don't know but they certainly don't distribute it using trackers. Trackers have their own problems with distribution, which is people like having a single file format for all of this stuff, and MP3 is the standard these days. What you don't want is... This stuff originated in the demo scene, and for all that you can say about demo sceners, they are not big on things like documentation and unit tests and whatnot. And actually getting a specification for these formats, the original implementation didn't come with source code. There were dozens and hundreds of people who went and re-implemented this stuff over the years. They all had their own quirks. Actually trying to get stuff to play the same on regardless of the software ever using, trying to get this stuff to play the same on every playback software out there is a pain, frankly. It's not a, gen it's a hard problem. And we have got this accumulated baggage of the fact that this was the overwhelmingly popular format for music. Uh, it was everywhere. People used it in games, in demos, and uh, we uh, got to the stage where people were just uh, cramming more and more into it. So people have stopped actually distributing this stuff as tracker modules. Instead, the concept of uh, tracking, tracking programs have kind of morphed into what are called digital audio workstations, which are basically sequencers with digital signal processing capabilities. And even contemporary trackers that actually call themselves trackers and have got this uh, demo scene heritage are starting to go in the direction of DSP plugins. And there is this standard called VST by Steinberg, who make Cubase, which has been around since 1996 or so. And even the standard is proprietary. But there is this whole ecosystem of people who are selling proprietary DSP plugins and in instruments and sample libraries and uh, so on. And it is all based on the assumption that the musician is the person who goes and buys all of this stuff. They accumulate the library of the stuff they want to have and be able to use. Then they make their music with it. 
They mix it down, they have a recording, they distribute the recording. And there are massive amounts of assumptions in here. I mean, even things like Modplug and Renoise, which call themselves trackers, have got support for this now. But Renoise is particularly interesting because it's a, a proprietary payware app, but they have a free demo version. And there is one, precisely one, major feature missing from the demo version. It can do pretty much anything. It can load and save Renoise files. It, it has got the full editing capabilities. The single feature they left out is render to wave. They, have, they are betting their entire business model on the assumption that people who want to use this software seriously will want to mix down to MP3 or some other format that is just basically PCM. Which is astounding, really. Uh, where are we? I think this is heading very much in the wrong direction. I think they are missing the entire point of trackers, which is that if you're going to make this stuff on a computer, then you should be able to share it on the computer. You do not have, you do not have to depend on having the person who you are trying to send it to, having copies of all of these proprietary uh, DSP plugins and the proprietary software that they plug into and all of the other ecosystem. This stuff should be open source. But this is not the only problem with tracking. It, has, it wasn't well designed from the beginning. It was, it was designed by demo seniors, and they were trying to solve the problem at hand, and it has essentially grown by accretion since then. Here's the Kapotaka command set. It is kind of uh, bizarre and ungainly and uh, not very well thought out, and there's all sorts of stuff in here and not a whole lot of orthogonality. And everyone who has come along since, who has made, been trying to make a file format, has thought, we want to be backward compatible. So, we take a copy of the ProTracker command set and bolt bits onto it. It only gets worse from here. Here's the XM command set. The stuff on the left is the stuff that was in the previous slide. Then on the right, there's all of the extra stuff they added this time. And it just gets incomprehensible quickly. And actually trying to learn all of this stuff, I mean, I've not got this stuff memorized, and I've written a ProTracker player. It's, it's just crackers. So I think that uh, checking the assumption of, uh, if we want to be backward compatible, we need to uh, have all of the commands from the previous there is this assumption that pattern data is somehow sacred, that uh, you should keep the pattern data, but, and you should modify the play routine to uh, add all the complexity in the play routine, keep the pattern data untouched, as it were. And I think that's the wrong way to go. So if we have a look at this again, if the stuff that we actually need, there is a whole lot of stuff for pitch slides, there's a whole lot of stuff about volumes. If we, just for a minute, imagine that we have abstracted out all the pitch and volume stuff, what do we actually need out of this? And it's not a lot. Which, this is suddenly starting to look a whole lot more minimal. And I think that minimalism is very much the way to go here. What we need to do is pick a good set of primitives a good, powerful set of primitives, and see what we can build with them. And, but in the, in the, but by keeping backward compatibility with with the existing formats by having a sufficiently powerful set of primitives that you can express all of the stuff that they could do, but without having to have all the baggage that they carried along. And. I am proposing doing this in JavaScript. Which sounds a bit crackers. <laughs> but it's not that bad. 
And there are reasons why I'm doing it in JavaScript, not least of which is that it solves the software distribution problem, which is that nobody has these players anymore. Nobody can read these formats. Your Apple did not even consider having a mod player in the iPod. But web browsers these days are actually pretty good. As of the past, in the past 12 months, both Google and Mozilla have brought out browsers that have sufficiently fast JavaScript engines and have a JavaScript audio API, essentially a uh, way of writing to DevDSP from JavaScript, which suddenly makes a whole lot of things possible. And nobody's really explored the possibilities. What happens if you stick this stuff on the web? And I think it's an interesting direction to go. There have been attempts before that. There are a couple of people who have tried to write a mod player in JavaScript. But they're basically weekend hacks. And as far as I know, they're not actually attempting the editing problem, which is the big problem. Actually, writing a uh, pro tracker play routine is uh, peanuts by comparison. So, stop. There are people, this hasn't been tried yet. I'm uh, wondering if people might. We have things like uh, C, C to uh, LLVM. We have LLVM JavaScript backend, so people can compile C code to JavaScript. And there's uh, a whole lot of uh, existing code for mod playback out there. And it's only a matter of time before someone goes and ports all of this stuff. I give it 12 months tops. So this time next year. But it's not really the problem I'm trying to solve, because what I want to do is solve the editing problem. I want to be able to hack this stuff. And just having a player is no good at all. There are people who have looked at the editing problem. There are a couple of uh, trackers, but they are not really... Uh, one of them is a port of an existing tracker in Flash, which doesn't count in my book. There's uh, a uh, soft synth based uh, one. Soft synths are awesome. I'll come back to soft synths. I do ultimately want a soft synth. But sample-based synthesis has an incredibly useful property, which is it can play back anything. If you can't do what you want with a soft synth, and you are trying to make a, a particular effect, or you have uh, vocals or whatever, you are completely screwed. There's nothing you can do. Samples, for all their limitations, you can actually render anything you like to a sample. It's not the direction I want to go in, but it means that we can slowly expand the base of what is possible with a soft synth while having a backup of uh, just rendering it as a sample, which is a very useful thing to have, and it makes uh, life a whole lot more useful in terms of what you can actually achieve. But all these web-based uh, tracker people, they are not seeing the big picture. They are essentially looking at trackers as they have always been. That is not what I want to do. What I want is a web-based tracker plus a repository of uh, music, which is free and free. I don't know what the license would be best for all of this stuff. I mean, I'm claiming that this is source code. I don't know if that means the GPL is best or not, but I suspect not. I suspect it's its own little niche. That will need figuring out. But sticking what is essentially a music editor together with a repository of music and music components, and essentially making this into some kind of uh, wiki slash uh, GitHub uh, mashup, I think would be awesome. So, that is what I would like to do. I have this idea for a project. It is called Fubal. It used to be called ModPlayJS. 
What can I say? I suck at naming. It's, it's still vaporware. It does not exist yet. But in the time honored tradition, I have some kind of demo of what I have so far, which I am hoping I will get to show you briefly. This is uh, running in Firefox, as you can uh, see there. And this is uh, playing one of the uh, classic uh, four channel mods uh, called Space Debris. And we can see uh, some very sparse pattern data here. Let's just see if we can get audio out of this. Are we getting audio? No audio? Oh, there we go. It stalls sometimes. Don't know why. Etc. One of the nice things about this <laughs> is you can see here all of the slides at the beginning have been pre processed into a pitch envelope here. This was the we heard at the beginning. It originally started off as a whole bunch of incomprehensible commands out of the command set I showed you previously. And this was pre-processed when this file was loaded, it all in JavaScript, to something that is a whole lot more user-friendly. Now, you can actually see from the pattern data, there are pretty much no effects here. Given that this is a ProTracker file originally, nothing in here is actually using ProTracker effects other than the very, very, very small subset that I was, used to, that I was using previously because it has all been split out. Which I think... Actually getting this stuff to be usefully editable is a much harder problem. But as a proof of concept of a minimal play routine, I think this is pretty good. We have got good support for loading ProTracker at S3M, and XM is a kind of wonky, but it sort of works. And more formats would be nice, but what I want to do is to settle on a good set of primitives to build an editor with, that people can actually go make music with. And it's just a bonus being able to load all of these existing files. How are we doing for time? OK, that's good. Uh, we've uh, got a few uh, other bits and pieces here. We have a uh, actual sample editor using Canvas. And you can uh, play. Etc. And uh, we've got all of the other stuff here. But all of this is just basically a proof of concept. I very much uh, want to uh, get this into some kind of uh, collaborative mu uh, music uh, making tool. And I've uh, got a little quote to end with, uh, which I think uh, sums up uh, my position on this kind of nicely which is this. We, we, yeah, it's, it's long, I know. <laughs> it's worth it. We tend to think of music as a consumable end product versus something you build or assemble. Something, music is something you buy, something you download, something you play. That's what text used to be too, but took, putting text on the web and specifically assembling text using code changed that forever. Just as we mix text from different sources, dynamically overlay it, transform it, translate it, etc. What if you could listen to music being mixed and altered live in your browser? When music becomes algorithmic, scriptable, and composable, any number of new things will happen. And this was from a guy at Mozilla who was trying, this was his rationale for why they should actually build this Firefox audio API, the one that we've just been demoing. And this kind of vision, this is the world I want to live in. 
I want control over this stuff. Perhaps you do too. If you do, come and talk to me. Thank you. Any questions? Not working. Yes, uh, we have uh, about five minutes for questions, I think. Yeah, but my phone mic is. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to point out that fraud and files like that act kind of died off, but this. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, so it's, it's not so much of a question, more of like pointing out that the development on like this type of protocol and these sorts of things has continued. It's just they're taking like strange approaches to it. Like in around 1991, um, the PlayStation One, they actually developed a piece of software for it called MTV Music Generator, which is basically exactly what they're doing on a console. It's uh, sort of like a tracker where you can input sample data. <laughs> into the file and write, like create a file that has all this stuff already on there. It comes with its own database of samples and sounds that you can manipulate from there. The problem at the time is the limitation on the amount of information you can insert. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, basically, um, this sort of thing is actually, has been continuing, like people are developing this sort of software, they're just taking strange avenues for it, like consoles and things like that. Look up like MTV Music Generator or something like that. It's just a little program, but it's the same idea. Okay. So the uh, non-question was uh, about people having uh, tried this kind of stuff on, on hey, consoles sorry. like the PlayStation. Hey, can you repeat the question? Uh, can you repeat what he said? I'm very sorry. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> people have uh, tried to do a whole lot of... Uh, this stuff has been around for a long time. People, yes, have uh, tried to uh, do it on consoles. People have uh, written uh, this kind of stuff for Game Boy. People have uh, made it uh, for all sorts of uh, strange platforms. What they have not done is actually tried to get a community of people actually uh, sharing this stuff. They have basically been in it because uh, it's interesting from a technical perspective, not because uh, they think it's the, the, the best way to actually create music. And I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what to say about that just at the minute. Have we got any more questions? Yes, we've got two more. Yeah, go. We've got time for two more. I've got one from uh, our angel over here. Yeah. What are the chances of this uh, thing running in other browsers? Is the API in Firefox um, open standard or their own? Put it. Uh, what are the chances that uh, your software can run in other browsers than Firefox? Uh, the, you're asking about the Firefox audio API? Yes, uh, is the API of Firefox uh, a standard API or is this something... It, it's, it's Mozilla specific, but Google are trying to standardize it. Uh, Google have got uh, a different one, which is not the Firefox one. This works in both of them. But I suspect the Google, the Google one is a whole lot uh, bigger. And uh, it's essentially Canvas for audio, but uh, whereas Firefox is uh, basically you write PCM samples. Was that your question? And last okay. question. Um, have you heard of something called the uh, Free Music Archive? Uh, I have uh, not heard of the Free Music Archive. Uh, okay. is, it a, uh, uh, is it a repository of recordings? It, it's exactly or it what it, yeah, like it sounds. It's, it's a publicly available repository for all kinds of uh, self-produced music okay. uh, based on the Creative Commons license. Um, it's run by a station called WFMU in New York City. Um, it's pretty much 
they're, they're exact, this is kind of exactly the kind of thing you should be, you should, you should be looking at. Okay, that's and, good. Yeah. I am aware of uh, a whole lot of uh, free uh, repositories of music recordings. I have, I'm aware of a, at least a couple of places that have got free samples for... Uh, for contribution, this is for users to contribute stuff. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'm very sorry, there are more questions. Where can people okay, find got, you? Pardon? Where can people uh, find you if they will, have uh, more questions? Be outside. Outside? Yeah, sure. Thank <laughs> you.